One of the head honchos at Bethesda Game Studios is a guy by the name Emil Pagliarulo. Okay. Emil Pagliarulo has been around forever. Okay. Like this guy. Let me see. The making of the. No. Uh, Fallout 3. This is Emil back at probably like 2007 or 8 for the uh, making of Call of. Or Fall of. I can't read. The making of Fallout 3 DVD. It was included in, in the collector's edition of Fallout 3. So this is probably like 2007 when they're filming this. He's been around since then. And now he he has lost like a ton of weight. He is like low-key kind of buff as well. Like it's crazy. It's crazy. But Todd has described it. No, that's not him. Todd has described it as... Um, he is like the guy that he assigns to the wacky, crazy narrative stuff. So like when they needed to find a way to have all of the runes like written the, in dragon language for Skyrim that also translated to English. And then they also needed the chant for like uh, that, that they sing in the main theme, all of that stuff. He's the guy that like went home and wrote that stuff. Like this guy probably is up there with Todd Howard in terms of being responsible for some of the games that you know and love so much. Okay. Like he's that guy. So I want to be, I want to be uh, clear with him uh, or with everybody up front about him, that this guy is very accomplished, has a long history and has worked and had a major role in some of likely your favorite games of all time, like Skyrim, Fallout 3, Fallout 4. You know, he's, he's been there for a very, very long time. He also worked on Starfield. You guys know how I feel about Starfield. I've been very open about it. But um, it seems like Emil has also heard what some other people have said about Starfield and what they think about it. And it seemed like he had enough at some point. So he tweeted out, this was two days ago at this point. So right after, I saw this after we finished uh, streaming, but um, you can see he's also studio design director is his official title. So studio design director, he's responsible for a lot of the main gameplay design decisions, the decisions of what they prioritize, what they don't. He's, he's the guy. So what he says is funny how disconnected some players are from the realities of game development. And yet they speak with complete authority. I mean, I can guess what it takes to make a hostess Twinkie, but I don't work in the factory. So what the hell do I really know? Not a lot. Part of me really gets it. When you're a consumer and spend money on things, that gives you the right to complain about those things. I spend a lot of money on games every year, and sometimes it takes a lot for me to not scream into the internet's collective consciousness. To be fair, if you're a game developer, I'm sure it's gotta be really, really tough to keep your like opinions to yourself. Cause like he's right, like it's it's kind of weird if you come out and like start slinging crap at each other and being like, hey, Santa Monica, what was behind this design decision? cringe like it makes you look bad it reflects badly on your company so you just have to kind of smile and nod and everybody has to be friendly but i'm sure they have strong opinions either which way i don't complain about games on socials for two main reasons one i know how hard it is to make games and i have too much respect for my fellow devs and two i work for a game studio and it would be uncool and unprofessional for me to do so but sometimes i want to oh boy most people don't have these constraints and are free to post whatever they want the internet is a glorious wild west wild wild west and i wouldn't have it any other way and there was a time when i exercised that right freely when i was writing game reviews for adrenaline vault forever ago i was absolutely that person who would say whatever i wanted about a game good or bad sometimes the good was over enthusiastically too good and sometimes the bad was me being a sarcastic asshat <laughs> but throughout the time that time i actually had no inkling what game development was actually like how hard the designers programmers artists producers and everyone worked the struggle to bring a vision to life with constantly shifting resources, the stress. This isn't me complaining about my job. I've experienced all these things and will again. It's the nature of AAA game development, but I also have a great position and I am still gainfully employed after 21 plus years, a blessing considering the thousands of layoffs this year. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind because the internet, but given my position, I can't share the truth. And the truth is nobody sets out to make a bad game. And most game devs are incredibly talented, even if the game they release isn't up to par. See. I never knew this before, but if nothing else, video game development is a series of concessions and tough decisions. There's that perfect game you want to make, and then there's the game you can make. Sometimes if, if the gods smile on you, those two are very close. Pause. Time out. This directly echoes something that Todd Howard has said that he has 
uh, been saying for years and years and years over at Bethesda Game Studios. Basically, what Todd would always say is, we can do anything, we just can't do everything. So if you want to make like a huge, um, like uh, open world uh, fantasy game where you can go be whatever you want to be, have dragon powers and all that, you can do all of that. There are limitations though, you know, we... we uh, at the time, back in 2011, there's limitations on what you could achieve in terms of frame rate, in terms of overall scope. There's limits on how many enemies you can have on screen at a time. There's limitations on how big the certain, you know, combat encounters can be. There's all sorts of really, really, you know, small con uh, constraints that you have to abide by. But then in the context of other games, you look at something like Starfield. It's not just limited by those broader things. It's also limited by your own tech. Like, um, what your engine is actually capable of doing. If your engine is only capable of having X number of triangles on screen at a time rendered without other things being um, cold, like you're limited by that limitation and it's just a reality of the situation that the engine can only handle that much. Or if you only have for the console, like what was it on the 360, 512 megs or something of RAM? It was something crazy like that. You're limited by that. That's what you have to play with. You can't change it. You just got to suck it up and deal with it. So there's always limitations like that that you're struggling with. And you have to make concessions that, hey, we would rather achieve, like well, a lot of these live service games, we'd rather achieve 60 frames than really push ray tracing or then really push um, larger arenas and stuff like that. We'd rather push that than, than lean into this other thing that we think is less valuable to players. And I acknowledge that. I would hope most of us can understand that. In the case of something like Starfield, which I think is what Emil is directly referencing with all of this, is people having unfair expectations of like Starfield and what it was able to achieve. I can understand that he feels that perhaps it's unfair to call it out because Starfield's really tough to make. And yes, they did some things and didn't do others. And people are frustrated that those other things are not there. But the point with all these uh, comments and, and statements is that we think that the decisions on what to concede and what not to concede, those mistakes or those decisions were mistakes. Like the choice to not provide like any means of transportation on planets, I think is a mistake in, in design uh, for, for actual exploration. Not even having any type of mount was a strange choice. Even like a motorcycle or something. I think it's it's just, it was a bad choice. I don't think it helped exploration. I think it hindered it and, and hurt it. And that's what we're saying. Like, we're not saying it would have been easy to, to add mounts or to add vehicles and things like that, but we're just saying it would have been nice to have it. And now they're actually walking back and apparently um, Bethesda said that they're working on new ways to, I think they said explore or traverse um, the game. So next year we should be getting updates to that. Like uh, maybe vehicles are being added or something. I don't know. But yeah, so far I think everything he said is like, yeah, no, that's, that's fair. I get that. He continues on. But in order to get there, in order to get as close or get it as close as possible to the vision, the team has to push itself harder and harder, often while dealing with devs being shuffled around or leaving, looming deadlines and creative decisions you wish you didn't have to make. And the team is absolutely the operative word there. Lots and lots of folks doing lots of work, writing, level building, making character models, coding game systems, trying to schedule it all so it can be done on time and folks don't burn out and on and on and on. So sure, you can dislike parts of a game. You can hate on a game entirely, but don't fool yourself into thinking you know why it is the way it is unless it's somehow documented and verified or how it got to be that way good or bad chances are unless you've made your a game yourself you don't know who made certain decisions who did specific work how many people were actually available to do that work anytime challenges faced or how often you had to overcome technology itself this one is huge i totally agree and that was one of the most clearly and evidently obvious uh restraints with starfield specifically is that the technology limitations were massive um, he goes on, so yes, love games, buy them, play them, and complain to your heart's content. It's sort of the nature of the developer slash player transactional relationship, but just know that the game you're playing is in some ways a freaking miracle in and of itself. Normal people have come together to work for years for one goal to bring you fun and happiness, so it helps to remember that and them. Now, a lot of people kind of jumped down his throat for this and have been like, hey, this this is another example of of... Bethesda being extremely out of touch and this is like, this is insane and this is another example of Bethesda just being out of touch and all this. Like this guy, um, Robert, said 
This right here should be the final nail in the coffin for this company. At least for me, it is the gaslighting, blaming the customer and their own disconnect is astonishing. And honestly, I don't, I'm not sure if I see it that way. I, I don't see a lot of gaslighting in what he said. I took what he said in these posts as sort of trying to remind people to like really appreciate what we have here. A game doesn't have to be a 10 out of 10. And even if it's not a 10 out of 10, it's still a technical marvel. Like when you actually think of what's happening, like you have a, a chunk of silicon that is performing like computations constantly, uh, millions of times a second to figure out, okay, the player put this button down. That means the character moves and we calculate how far he moves and that moves the cameras on the character's body forward this distance. So now the field of view calculated at this FOV is this way and this way. So now if we draw the frame, we have to go pixel by pixel by pixel and render each of those pixels based on what's on screen. Meanwhile, while we're computing that, we also have to calculate what these enemies are doing, what, okay, this attack, this bullet traveled out of the barrel of the gun and landed two frames later right there. And it dealt this damage that we calculate this way. We calculate that, subtract it from their overall health, but they have all these resistance modifiers and they have armor. So we calculate that. And then, you know, all of this stuff is happening in a single frame. It's crazy. All of this is happening in a single frame. So it is a marvel, and I think we should appreciate all of that. And I, I understand the message he's putting forward here. I think the problem with the post is that it, because of his role at Bethesda, and, and I think like if anybody else put this tweet out, if just a random person put this tweet thread out, I don't think people would have been upset about it. But because of his position within Bethesda, it feels like this is him deflecting blame or or um, not even necessarily deflecting. It's It's like dismissing criticism because it's like saying that the audience is ungrateful. It's like, oh, you didn't like Starfield? Well, just take a minute to appreciate how crazy it is that this game even runs. It's like, yeah, it it is, but you're also charging 70 bucks or, you know, it's on Game Pass, so that is a little different. But, you know, it's still like a video game that is competing against all of these other video games that have achieved the same kind of thing. They still launch, they still operate fine. You know, they, they have huge worlds to explore but they might be more fun or they might be more polished or more up to date technologically. And, and so like, it doesn't like, we can appreciate stuff, but it doesn't really change the, the formula or the question at the core here, you know? And he replied to this, this tweet, uh, from Robert and said, Hey Robert, it honestly wasn't my intent to gaslight or blame anyone. Any criticisms of Starfield or any other game are totally fair, especially if you paid for it. I said as much in my post, I was too vaguely referring to misinformation and personal attacks. And I think this is like, when you read through it with the, like through the lens of him being frustrated at being personally attacked for Starfield's shortcomings, I think it makes a lot more sense. And I think that they certainly have dealt with that. I mean, we've heard of some of the insanity that people have engaged with when they don't like a video game. Like, oh, they didn't like Starfield. And so they're going to try to dox the developers and give them death threats and all sorts of insane stuff. We've heard of all of that. And I'm sure that they dealt with a lot of crap. That's apparently <laughs> I mentioned on the podcast like a week ago or something that I had heard that, you know, a lot of developers, once they release a game, they all go on vacation. You know, they take a week or two to go and take a vacation and uh, relax because they've been in grind and all this other stuff. And I had somebody reach out to me, a developer uh, reach out to me that had previously worked at Naughty Dog uh, and they launched. They were like there technically during the launch of The Last of Us Part Two and everything that went down with that. And. What he told me was that part of the reason that they have often like scheduled vacations for a large chunk of the team, not the whole team goes on vacation, but a good number of them will take a break after the launch is actually so that they can fully disconnect in case there is negative feedback. They don't have to deal with it. And I was like, how sad is that? That people are having to like schedule vacations in advance so that they can shut their phones off and not be on social media because they're going to be getting death threats from neckbeard gamers and incels who are upset that this companion is not romanceable or something like that's so crazy that's so crazy to me like that's that's just insane to me anyway that's that's kind of beside the point with all of this though i took this post as him just trying to be like hey let's just take a minute to smell the roses and not be hyper hyper negative 
I get that message. I understand what he's he's saying. I do think the way that this comes off is that he's saying, you know, if you're going to criticize Starfield, your criticisms are less valid because you don't understand game development and how hard it is to make games. And I get it. Most people that are critiquing and criticizing Starfield have never made a video game themselves. That's absolutely true. But at the end of the day, they're the customer. They're the ones that the game is allegedly designed for. And if your customers and your fans are not happy with the decisions you made during this difficult process, it's, uh, I get it was difficult to make those decisions, but you made the wrong decisions. Like that's just, it is what it is. Like, yeah, it was really tough to decide if we wanted to have no load screens or if we wanted to have a thousand planets and we chose a thousand planets. Okay. I think that was the wrong choice. That's all we're saying. Like when we actually played the game, I think it was the wrong choice, frankly. Like, it's just, it's that simple. So I get what he's trying to say. I think from, coming from him, his perspective, his position within the company, I, I think it just comes off badly, unfortunately. But I think it was a well-intentioned post, and I'll, I'll uh, try to defend him on that point. Some of the responses are, are more or less saying the same thing. I feel that most reasonable people who are criticizing Starfield understand that concessions have to be made. These people aren't simply saying the game needs to be better. They're saying that Bethesda should have designed Starfield differently in order to make it better. Yeah, and that's absolutely fair. I was referring to the unreasonable people. Okay, I don't, I don't really know what you mean by that, but okay. <laughs> Nobody cares. You sell AAA prices and didn't deliver. The modders do. <laughs> Apparently the modders don't. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, I think this is dancing around the elephant in the room. Todd has a larger than life presence at Bethesda. And while it was influential in the creation of the studio in 2023, it's holding it back. The in-house engine is stale, but safe. The gameplay feels stuck 10 years ago. And absolutely. I mean, it's Todd has a huge role in the studio. There's been a lot of reporting that Todd has been trying very hard to not be the centerpiece. Daniel M. But... donated $50 through Super Chat. Oh, geez. Thank you. GS equals it just works. You knows the rules. XD. You <laughs> knows the rules. You all knows the rules. It just works. It just works. Shout out to the chess club. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, my friend. Very generous. 50. Gee whiz. All of that happened. I, I get it. And this is, you know, compounded onto a couple of other things that came out around the same time. You know, Starfield definitely can't catch a break. So this was an article written by IGN which obviously uh, upset some people. Skyrim's together or Skyrim together's modders are canceling their work on Starfield's multiplayer mode with one saying the game is boring, <laughs> which I guess originally started at VG247. The Skyrim co-op modder gives up on developing Starfield together because quote, this game is effing trash. I'm not going to put my heart and soul into a mod for a game as mediocre as this. I mean, what else can you say? Like the modders are the ones that pour so much love and effort into these games and work to to get them built and changed and if they're like eh, i'm good i'm good i mean what else can you say what else can you say um they say quote when starfield released i was hyped like a lot of people but probably for different reasons the modder announced in a post to skyrim together's discord channel i spent launch day and a few days after reverse engineering the game and porting over gameplay hooks from skyrim together to potentially starfield together mod i ported about 70% of Skyrim together reversed code to Starfield together. There was just one problem. The game is effing trash. After saying that in their estimation, Starfield is, quote, boring, bland, and lacks the main draw of Bethesda games, exploration in a lively and handcrafted world. I won't be continuing development on Starfield together. I'm going to put my heart and soul into a mod for a game or I'm not going to put my heart and soul into a mod for a game as mediocre as this. They said they did also add that they've uploaded the code they put together in an open source format in order to make it available to anyone who wants to take on the task of finishing it. Though, even if this does happen, don't expect the mod to be playable anytime soon. With Kosideki, I don't know, having warned that completing the mod will likely require upwards of 100 plus hours of work. Oof! <laughs> That's a punch to the gut. Oh man. When you're like most hardcore modders that are creating co-op mods so that you can play Starfield together side by side with friends. They're like, no, I'm good, man. I'm done. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. But I mean, I think it reflects a frustration that a lot of people have. I mean, a lot of people are, are, just frustrated with it. And it goes back to the core problem of Starfield, which was visible from the moment that they announced it, which is simply that it is a game developed by a studio that's really good at one thing, but the game is designed around a totally different thing. 
And as a result, it's just mediocre because they're not experts in this. They were really good at handcrafted worlds, designed carefully with environmental storytelling, great stories, and this sandbox approach to gameplay. And they decided to make a procedural adventure game with little bitty fishbowls for you to explore. And it's just not very fun. <laughs> like, it's just... It's not very fun. All of this kind of compiles uh, in an update that Bethesda also revealed that they are working on new ways of traveling next year, which is interesting. They say that they're working on big changes, including ongoing quest fixes, support for FSR 3, XESS, and this one big one, new ways of traveling, which makes me think vehicles. If it's not vehicles, like if it's different engines and stuff for your ship, I'm going to be a little disappointed. But hopefully it's just like rovers and stuff like that. That's the hope at least. A small new update rolled out for Starfield today that fixes a crash issue during uh, saves, clears up a problem with guns not spawning properly, and gets rid of space Klingons, a glitch that saw rocks, forests, <laughs> and other bits of space stuff follow players around wherever they went. It almost sounds like a shame having to bid farewell to the cute little asteroids who were following spacers around like lost puppies, but it was a game-breaking bug for some players, so best to see it gone. Um, all good news, but the more interesting came in a message that they posted on Starfield subreddit talking about plans for 2024. You can see their official post says, um, they addressed that pet asteroid thing. We've been hard at work working on many of the issues you've posted and expect an update early next year that will include large number, large number of in-progress quest fixes as well as FSR 3X ESS. They've fixed several quest issues from occurring. In-progress quest fixes are much harder to fix. And we built a new system to correct those without you having to roll back your save. That's awesome. This was actually a problem that I ran into with Alan Wake 2. If you guys remember, I ran into a game-breaking bug that locked me out of progressing the story and finishing it. Even though I was only like 40 minutes away from the credits rolling, I hit this, this bug that like locked me from progress and they did fix it within like a week of the game launching, but only for new saves. So if I want to actually, like I watched videos of everything I didn't get to play, so I, I know all of that. But if I ever want to play it myself, I have to restart completely because apparently it won't even fix itself. If you go like back a save, you have to restart your save file, which sucks. So it's cool to see that they're fixing <laughs> in progress quests. Uh, that are bugged out without you having to start them over, which is awesome. We're also hard at work on many of new features. Okay, it wasn't just me. Hard at work on many of new features. <laughs> Jesus, Bethesda, like, what are we doing? They can't even type properly. Um, I, I guess I can't say much because I can't read properly, but what are you going to do? Okay, try, try it again. We're also hard at work on many of new features you asked for from city maps to mod support to all new ways of traveling stay tuned these will be rolling out with regular cadence of fixes and updates we expect to have roughly every six weeks if something can be done in a smaller hot fix in between like the asteroids we and we still feel it's safe we'll get one of those out as well safe is the key here we do take a lot of time to test even the smallest change hope this information helps if there are items you want more info on or issues to make us aware of. Keep posting here or on our official Discord. Thanks again, blah, blah, blah. And then top comment, since city maps, new ways of traveling are coming in the game, can we possibly also get animated overlays over certain loading screens due to the engine capabilities? We, of course, cannot land on or take off of a planet physically, but an animated overlay can still make you feel that you are doing so. And technically, it is a loading screen, but one that will still keep you immersed in the game. Yeah, this is, this is one of those things, going back to Emil's frustrations, where he's like, people don't understand how game development works. I'm like, even if you found clever ways to cover up the load screens, they'd feel way better. And that was just a, a decision not to do that. Like, I do like that the load screens, they do intersperse like player photo mode captures. Like, that's kind of cool. I like that. But I, I still would prefer if you're traveling from planet surface into space, just do like a crazy warp effect just like in God of War, where everything kind of flashes white as you walk through the doorway at the, those fast travel, whatever they're called doors, just flash white. And then you walk in and it, it feels like it was a smooth thing, even though there was technically a quick little load screen as you warped there. That's all we, we would really want, like just smooth it out. And that's the thing is it just felt like there were all of these little things that could have made Starfield so much better that they just didn't bother with because they're like, eh, players will be fine or modders will fix it, whatever, you know, eh. It'll be fine. It just feels like they didn't do proper player testing. Well, there was years ago, 
I think it was around the time of Fallout 4, Todd said that they don't do player testing. I don't I don't think that's still true because I they definitely did player testing for Fallout 76, but I don't, maybe they don't do it for single player games. I don't know. I'd have to dig through some old interviews because it was all the way back in like 2013, 14. Now he says the whole team tests. Todd said that Starfield was basically done by holiday of 2022 and to help test the Mammoth RPG, virtually everyone on the dev team got a build to play on their own Xbox and uh, PCs at home over the holidays. That's kind of interesting. I mean, it's funny that it was done like nine months ahead of schedule, basically, or well, nine months, not necessarily ahead of schedule because that was probably part of the schedule, but like nine months ahead of launch and they were working on developing it and, and refining it. <laughs> and then it still has all these problems with you just crazy. It just seems like tool set issues, really, man. It just seems like tool sets, but it's crazy. The narrative has shifted so much. I mean, one of the top votes on on the Starfield Steam community board. Did Todd Howard realize that the game is bad? I think he realized in 2021 or 22, but there was no way out. Thus, he created the Starfield Direct to show us that he is not the only one responsible for this disaster. Am I right? <laughs> Can you imagine if that's what it was? He was like, oh God, this is not coming together. So he decides to go off and like make this video being like, see, it's a, co it's a collaborative effort. Everyone's responsible. I don't know. I don't think that's what it was. I, I like, again, we're all like bashing Starfield as if it's, it's like a two out of 10. It's not like Starfield is a solid, I think like seven out of 10. I think that that rating by IGN was fair. I think for me, the longer I played it, the worse it got. So it probably started at like eight out of 10. And after like, however many hours it whittled down and became more like a seven. But to me, it just didn't click together. But there's still a lot of good stuff there. I just think like the promise of a thousand planets and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of gameplay was was overstated to say the very least. But after like 25, 30 hours, I think you're, you're probably having a good time. You know, that's probably a time to hang it up to be good. You know, maybe you can get to 40 or 50 hours. But I, I think that that's where it's in a good spot and you can walk away. But when people try to play it as though they were playing Fallout 4 or Skyrim, they end up hating it because it's not that kind of game. But I think the reason that you're seeing such a negative and vitriolic response to it now is that as time has gone by, people have realized it really did not live up to the hype that they felt for it. And as we all know, hype, once it, it doesn't live up to the hype, players get, get like scored, you know, they, they get very bitter. And it takes years and years and years for them to dig themselves out of that and maybe look at it more objectively. But this is why, like, I push so hard for us not to play around with hype. What does hype do, Luke? <laughs> hype makes you stupid. It makes you stupid. And it if, if the game doesn't live up to it, it can make you mighty bitter. And that's what's happening here. And what's most notable is that it's happening to, to Bethesda's own core fan base, like those modders that are responsible for some of the incredible technological feats of, of games, like actually managing to add co-op to these single player games. That's crazy impressive. But even they, the core, core base are like, eh, <laughs> we're good. I'm done. <laughs> and that that's something that you can't just dig yourself out of. I mean, at that point, you're, you're in some serious trouble. But what are you going to do? I mean, it's at, at this point, the game... It's probably going to get improved. It's probably going to shift. It's going to change a little bit, but I, I just don't think it, it did what it needed to do. And that's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. He took my thing.